this career and how you came to uh, be a part of the Atlanta student movement mm -hmm. or know about it. And so how long an introductory statement do you want? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> However long you okay. want to go, sir. Because you know, that was 52 years ago. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, and then uh, the first marker we're going to put up is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we're going to put a marker in front of one of the offices that was their headquarters across from the uh, Clark, Clark Atlanta. Sure. And um, if you want to talk about SNCC, any if you were a member of SNCC or if you had any, uh, if you participated in anything. That well, our, our student organization was considered a chapter of SNCC. It was a student Committee on Appeal for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, I believe, the name of our organization. And it was considered to be a part of SNCC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Julian Bunn yes. um, actually dropped out of school because I believe Julian would have graduated with me, but he sort of became full-time, you know, working with SNCC, and I think his office was at a church down the street. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so anything you want to say, mm -hmm. Just be one minute or be ten minutes. Do uh, you have a great story about some of the companies? Oh, I have snakes? stories. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll talk about so we'll talk uh -huh. about that. And then um, the efforts that the students made to desegregate municipal facilities, mm -hmm. parks, and recreations. And do you remember any specific um, marches or? Or, you know, happenings or the students going to jail or anything like sure. that. Did you yourself go to jail? Five times. Oh, wow. Including prison, by the way. There were five of us who went to prison. <laughs> this is um, really good. You know, you know, we had a big move on to fill the jails at one point. We really wanted to fill every jail cell in Atlanta. And Dr. King was involved with that, and he went to jail. So by the time my group, which was led by A.D. King, by the time that we got arrested, the jails were full, so they sent us to prison. So that's, that's how it happened that I actually went to prison, uh, along with A.D. and three other people. Mm -hmm. That was, I believe, 1962, I believe. Um, I have trouble now remembering exactly when, when thing, but I think it was 1962. That's when the Kennedys called to get Dr. King out of jail, and and they let all of us out of jail when they let him out of jail. So that's what I remember. So I have stories about that, too. Okay, are we good at sound? And yeah, we uh -huh. Great. Okay, so do you want me to go through each of the markers first to kind of jog your memory and give you an idea of what we're going to talk about, or you want to just go ahead and start? Yeah, because I may not remember the markers as well. Obviously, I remember uh, Riches, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't remember the name of the re Well, one restaurant was Lab's, I believe. Mm -hmm. And there was two other restaurants. Well, Auto House and mm -hmm. uh, Crystals. Mm -hmm. See, but I can't. I remember Labs because um, we put a lot of attention on Labs. And I remember the Riches movement to get blacks hired at Riches since we were spending our money there. That may have been the first place that I got arrested was the Riches. But and at Pickwick's. Yeah. That may have been where we got arrested and went to prison, but I'm not 100% sure about that. I just remember sitting at the counter, and a story around that, of course, is a spray bear story. You know that story? Yes, yeah, so he sprayed us, and he got arrested, too. So he went to prison when we went. But when we got out, uh, we asked that he be let out, too. That was the story. And uh, on getting released, he pledged that he was never going to do anything like that again, and he was going to fight for civil rights. And, yeah. And then uh, another marker is uh, the Pilgrimage for Democracy, which I understand SNCC led a uh, massive assembly and uh, rally at Hurt Park. Yeah, I'm trying to remember that I remember the biggest march that, of students that we had was very successful. I, I believe there were almost 5,000 people in that march, but I can't remember names of parks and things like that anymore. Um, but I think that was the one. Okay. And we'll talk about the Atlanta Inquirer mm -hmm. and how they came together. That was actually the student's newspaper. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And the movement lawyers, Donald Lee Hollowell and Howard Moore Jr., um, the Freedom Riders. Mm -hmm. We're going to put one down where the, where the bus terminal used to be, mm -hmm. down uh, near Andrew Young's 
uh, statue mm -hmm. now. Uh -huh. and, then the and you know, it was my hometown. It's where they burned the bus. Aniston. Aniston is where I grew up. Uh -huh. In fact, they just named a park for me. Oh, yeah, a wellness a park, a health and wellness park in Aniston. Very nice. But that was where they burned the bus. Yeah. Okay. And then um, there, I understand there were some sit-ins to desegregate Grady Memorial Hospital. Yeah, I don't remember participating, but I think that's right. Mm -hmm. But Grady, that would have been the 50, early 60s. So, yeah, and most hospitals in the South were segregated, and it was really the big thing that integrated hospitals, of course, was Medicare and Medicaid. Mm. And when the legislation said that a hospital couldn't get those funds unless they integrated, and that meant letting black physicians practice in those hospitals, not just because they, they were taking black patients, even though they were segregated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, were you at Warren Memorial when Dr. King gave, when they had to call on Dr. King to uh, calm the crowd because the students were upset that uh, the merchants, the downtown Atlanta mm -hmm. merchants, wanted you all to wait. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. The lunch oh, yeah. Until after the schools were. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, there are a few situations I remember in which we were asked to wait when. Well, Leroy Johnson was running, and the people thought that if we kept the movement up, it may hurt his chances of winning. But we refused to stop, uh, not being disrespectful of him, but we just didn't think there was a problem. But there was a division among the students about that, yes, sir. about you whether. That I was there. I think that's when I was president of the student body at, at Morehouse. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. So we want to talk a little bit about that because we're going to put one. Um, if not in front of Warren Memorial, it'll be across where the current markers are mm. now in front of uh, mm -hmm. Mount Moriah. Mm -hmm. But there were a few times in which people tried to get the students to either slow down or, or not to do something we wanted to do. But I, I think it was all in good spirit. I don't think we ever disagreed about the goal. We just disagreed sometimes about how to achieve it. Mm -hmm. And then Rush Memorial, I understand, was very supportive of the students. <clears throat> yeah. Meeting space. Yeah, that's where we used to practice how to fall downstairs if you got pushed and all that kind of stuff. I remember. Yeah. But the pastor of Rush was from Aniston, I believe, at that time. He had pastored a church in Aniston and then moved to Atlanta. So he was very supportive of it. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, well, let's go ahead with uh, the introduction, your introduction of yourself, where you're from, and how you came to Atlanta. And okay. Your, uh, history, your past. Okay. Well, my name is David Satcher, and I am the founder and director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute here at the Morehouse School of Medicine. And um, I attended Morehouse College from 1959 to 1963 as a pre-med student. And I left Morehouse to go to Case Western as an MD, PhD student. I was here during the heart of the student movement. Uh, I became involved in the fall of 1960, I think my sophomore year. And I remember specifically that at that time, the leaders were Lonnie King, uh, Marion Wright Elliman, who now has Children's Defense Fund, and Otis Moss, who went on to become just an outstanding minister. They were the leaders whom I remember. There were other leaders, Charles Black and some others later on. And then, of course, in my senior year, I became the leader of the student, uh, the student Committee on Appeal for Human Rights. I was also president of the Morehouse Student Body during that year, Morehouse Student Government. But um, I think the first time I, I was arrested was in 1960, in the fall, and I think it was around Riches when we were trying to get Riches to hire uh, blacks. And, but they also, we had trouble eating in the in the dining rooms and things, and they had we had to stand in a line and and wait and stuff like that. I remember those things, and I remember getting arrested at least three or four times associated with restaurants. And then, of course, the one time when the group I was in was sent to prison because we had successfully filled the jails. So that group was led by A.D. King, the younger brother of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and there were five of us in it. And that was the time when uh, Sprayberry, appropriately named, 
was spraying us uh, we, as we sat at the counter, and they had already called the police to arrest us. He was uh, spraying us. And so when the police came, uh, he, they arrested him along with us, and we all went to, I think it was the Atlanta prison outside of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is, was the impact of the Atlanta student movement here in Atlanta and across the United States? Well, I think the impact of the student movement can be viewed in two or three ways, um, starting with the impact that it had on Atlanta. And I don't think there's any question about the fact that the student movement changed Atlanta, but it also changed us, I mean, I think. And, and that's probably the most important thing, because I think since that period of time, those who participated have gone on to help change the, the country in a lot of ways. Uh, Certainly everywhere I've been, I have taken the spirit of that movement with me, whether it was as a medical student at Case Western or as director of the CDC or as Surgeon General. My attitude has always been that I had the responsibility uh, that went beyond just that position, that I had to make a difference uh, for good for people in this country who were often That's not good. <laughs> that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we're dealing with a few issues. Okay. Ask you uh, to talk to us about the appeal for human rights and how the students came together to form that document. Yeah, I didn't quite finish. I, I did say that I became involved, I believe, in the fall of 1960, and I pointed out at that time the leaders whom I remember were uh, Otis Moss, Marion Wright Edelman, and Lonnie King. Uh, there were other leaders, certainly Charles Black, but uh, those people stand out. I've maintained a relationship, for example, with Marion Wright Edelman throughout my career, but I met her when she was uh, a junior at Spelman, and, uh, and I became involved with these, these, this, this the movement. And I was also pointing out that in terms of memorable experiences, of course, uh, I went to jail five times, I believe, and most of the time it was trying to buy food in a restaurant. Uh, there are two most memorable experiences, and we had talked about the time that I, I was sent to prison because we had been successful at filling the jails. Uh, the goal of that particular uh, effort was to fill the jails in Atlanta. Dr. King was one of the first people arrested. I got arrested with A.D. King, Dr. King's younger brother, and three other people. So five of us were sent to the prison outside of Atlanta. Uh, and we were there when uh, Robert Kennedy called on behalf of uh, presidential candidate John Kennedy uh, and asked uh, the mayor to, get, to let Dr. King out of jail. So when that happened, we got out of jail too. And I told a story about, um, about Sprayberry who was the one who was spraying us in the restaurant with fly spray and who got arrested at the same time as we did. And, uh, but the interesting thing that I remember is that when we were let out of jail, A.D. King was the one who suggested that we ask the warden to let Sprayberry out of jail. And I didn't completely understand the significance of that at the time, but A.D.'s point was that nonviolence is, just, is not just about not hitting back, it's about not hating. And so we, we, we had the right spirit um, once we understood A.D. King's point. The last time I was uh, arrested, I was, in fact, head of the student movement my senior year. I was president of the student government at Morehouse, and I was head of the student movement, the Student Committee on Appeal for Human Rights, you know, a, a part of SNCC. And your dad, of course, at that time was uh, providing the leadership for SNCC in the, in the, he even dropped out of school. So he graduated two years after I did because he sort of gave full time to this effort. But at any rate, in the senior year, in my senior year, we were arrested uh, at a restaurant at a time when the business community was beginning to get really concerned about the student movement and all the problems we were causing for them. Uh, and it was, uh, when I got arrested, I was arrested with a young lady from Spelman, Annie Jo Weaver, who was an exchange student. And we decided, it was actually her idea, that we were going to hunger strike. So we ended up staying in jail for a whole week without eating. Um, and, uh, and I can't tell you what that was like. But it did get a lot of publicity. 
and uh, and I think it, it added to the momentum to really uh, desegregate their businesses in Atlanta. Okay, wonderful. And did you want to talk a little bit more about the appeal for human rights? Wait, 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 Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so I should be more explicit. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, one of one of the things that I pointed out was that um, the student committee on appeal for human rights um, it was a student movement sort of in Atlanta, and it included all of the Atlanta University schools and colleges. Uh, but Julian Bond uh, actually dropped out of school to sort of full time work uh, with SNCC um, here in Atlanta. And I remember that because I think we probably would have graduated together, but because Julian dropped out, I think he ended up graduating two years after I did, uh, but did a, just a great job and was fully committed to, to the movement. Okay, so let's talk about the desegregation of municipal build, uh, facilities. <clears throat> Excuse me, public schools and um, parks and city-owned, Pools, well, I think a lot of that desegregation occurred after I left. You know, we when we were in school, those places were not seg were not desegregated. But I think, in part, as a result of the student movement, just as restaurants and businesses decided to, uh, it was time to desegregate or integrate. Uh, a lot of other facilities followed. You know, with the leadership. Uh, Atlanta had leadership in the business community, and that's how it was different from a lot of other cities. You know, Atlanta had leadership in the black community, and it had the leadership in the business community. And when the business community decided that we weren't going away, um, I think they sat down with the leadership of Coca-Cola and some others and decided that it was time to, to act. But it, it, it means a lot to me. Uh, I know a lot of people take it, take it for granted, but I know when I was in medical school, I enjoyed coming to Atlanta and being able to eat in restaurants downtown without getting arrested. And so things that young people today take for granted. See, because Pascal's was really the only restaurant, for the most part, that we could go and sit down and eat when I was a student. And, uh, and I remember how important that was. I remember Usually when we got out of jail, the first place we would go would be the Pascals. And of course, a lot of our meetings were held there. So I still insist on going to Pascals on a regular basis. And I understand students brought a lawsuit against the city to help move that, along, that effort along to desegregate municipal facilities. Yeah, the, the students in Atlanta, I think, uh, did a great job of, of planning and foresight and, and bringing lawsuits and really pushing for change. It was a very informed. I'm not surprised that people like Marion Wright Elliman, Marion went on to become the first uh, black student to graduate from the law school in Mississippi. And as you know, she went on to uh, develop the Children's Defense Fund. And, uh, and we still uh, uh, have great communication. Okay, let's talk about some of the um Businesses, uh, we talked a little bit about that already, but uh, that the students targeted the Heart of Atlanta Motel and Pickrick's. Well, I, again, this is why my memory is not as acute as I would like for it to be. Uh, I, I remember a few of the businesses. I certainly remember Lebs, the restaurant that I think I may have been arrested twice in Lebs, and a lot of students. Uh, we targeted that. Riches, of course, when we first started, was segregated. And uh, we were concerned that they, didn't, they weren't hiring blacks, but really taking our money. And so it was one of the first facilities that we targeted, and we targeted several restaurants. But I apologize that my memory doesn't bring back the name of all the businesses. And in the Pilgrimage for Democracy, uh, 
the mass demonstration that took place in Hurt Park? I think uh, one of the really memorable things that the students did was to organize and get that kind of turnout. Because uh, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that for the most part, there were only a few students involved in the movement. It was not like, you know, half of the students in the AU Center were coming out. It, it was, there were a few students who were consistently pushing for change and going to jail. But, um, but I do think there were two events, and that was one of them. The other one was the one I mentioned when we made the commitment to fill the jails and were able to get a major turnout of students in Atlanta that fill the jails in Atlanta. Well, um, <laughs> well, I wish I could be more specific. I wish I could tell you that I had an acute memory for all of those events. And the fact of the matter is I, I don't any longer. But I do remember controversy, of course. That's the kind of thing you remember. And I know there were a few occasions on which the students were asked to sort of back off or wait. And, um, and I, I specifically remember during the time that um, uh, Senator Leroy Johnson was running, there were some people who, who sort of appealed to the students to, uh, to slow down or, or not to raise a lot of attention during that time. So there, were, there was disagreement um, about issues like that, about when we should slow down as opposed to continuing the momentum of the movement. And so that I remember. But I don't remember all the places. I remember one memorial church and the meeting that took place there and the controversy there about uh, the student activity. There was a time we disagreed with Dr. King, uh, but we always respected him. I, a group of students and I used to uh, walk from the Morehouse campus to Ebenezer whenever we knew that Dr. King was speaking. And uh, he was a tremendous motivation. We did not always agree on the pace of the movement. And I think that's what it means to be students. You're not supposed to necessarily agree with adults all the time. Okay, so the Atlanta Inquirer, uh, they were known for uh, providing news from a fair and impartial yeah. uh, perspective without fear or favor, and known as the voiceless, voiceless. You yeah. talk about the impact that Atlanta Enquirer had and how they came together, and that was the student's paper? Well, um, I remember they played a tremendous role, and I guess the present editor, John Smith, uh, graduated a few years ahead of me. He may have graduated in the late 50s, and I graduated in 63, but I know that over all of these years, uh, the Atlanta Enquirer has been a major resource uh, for the Atlanta community. But especially back in that time, when there was a lot of controversy about what we were doing, and where there was a need for a voice for the students. It was out of that need, I think, that the Atlanta Inquirer came to be. And John Smith and I still talk about that. And you know, he, um, it's amazing how he stayed the course over all of these years. Now, I know it's become more difficult for black papers and black businesses generally uh, to compete in an integrated society without, not ha without having the same level of capital. Uh, but so I, I have a special appreciation for the Atlanta Inquirer, the same as I do for PASCAS, and I'm re very pleased that PASCAS have been, has been able to continue to function and be successful. But as I travel throughout the country, uh, there are many businesses that existed during, in a segregated society, black businesses, and there were not enough of them uh, who have not necessarily survived in the competitive world of business. And I think that's unfortunate, because I, uh, I think we need to be more integrated in the business community and to have more capital to compete in the business community. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the movement that you started in 1960. Donald Hollowell and Howard Moore Jr. and their impact 
yeah. uh, on the students and the student movement? Well, first let me start with, with Howard Moore. Hemp Holmes and I were classmates. Uh, and he went to Morehouse for the first six months, the first semester. And Howard Moore was his lawyer working to get him uh, into the University of Georgia. And he was successful, so uh, Hamilton Holmes left Morehouse for the, in that second semester, I believe, and went to the University of Georgia and had a very successful uh, experience there and ended up going to medical school, I think, at Emory. Uh, unfortunately, Hemp, Hemp died uh, fairly young, I think in his mid-50s, but I, I had occasions to get together with him you know, after I came back to Atlanta. But I do remember his being, you know, in the first, there were two students, and I don't know why I'm blocking on the name of this, or the other student now, because she's so well known, but that's what happens when you get older. But anyway, the two of them went to uh, University of Georgia, but Howard Moore was the attorney. Don Holloway was the, the attorney who was always there uh, to make sure that we got a fair trial, and he got us out of jail most of the time. Uh, there was some business leaders like Jesse Hill and QV Williams who would provide money for the students to, you know, to go to bail for the students. But Don Holloway, uh, Hollowell and uh, Howard Moore uh, were, were attorneys who were always on the case there. Right, that's what yes, yes. He was the first mm -hmm. that time. Tremendous, uh, tremendous history of contributions in that area. He was committed. The Freedom Riders in Atlanta. Well, the Freedom Ride Riders, for the most part, came about after I had gone to medical school. And, uh, and uh, you know, John Lewis and others who, many of them, dropped out of school or delayed school for a year. Uh, what I remember most about the Freedom Ride is how they were attacked. I grew up in Anniston, Alabama, and uh, I know how vicious racism was in Anniston. And as you know, uh, the Freedom Riders were really attacked in Anniston. John Sigenthaler, who was working with Robert Kennedy and who went on to become editor of the Tennessean, and I had opportunity to work with him when I was president of Meharry, but John Sigenthaler was really beaten severely in Anniston, Alabama. And of course, the Freedom Riders faced that kind of abuse everywhere they went, whether it was Anniston or Birmingham. These were people who had tremendous courage and commitment. And I, have, I was in medical school when that, for the most part, when that was happening. But I have great, um, great appreciation for the Freedom Riders and what their work meant. Desegregation of Grady Memorial. Well, again, I don't remember many details about the desegregation of Grady. I think, uh, like most hospitals in the South, uh, they were they were segregated. Uh, the the major and and we, there were demonstration against uh, segregation at Grady, but as I look back on it, I think the major factor in the integration of hospitals in the South was the Medicare, Medicaid, and the provision uh, that said that you could not receive Medicare, Medicaid funds unless you were integrated, which meant uh, black physicians had to be able to practice in these hospitals, which was the issue that led to the major case in Greenboro. Mm -hmm. And I understand even afterwards, there was a wing for black people, and they were seen by only black daughters, uh, Doctor. black doctors, excuse me, and then yeah, and I don't know how long that went on at Grady, to tell you the truth. I don't remember how long that persisted. Mm -hmm. But that was a true all over the South, uh, that kind of segregation. There were even hospitals in the South where they didn't take black patients, and they certainly didn't allow black physicians to, to practice. So we, we came from that to the segregation of the hospitals, and then, of course, um, uh, uh, I think with Medicare, Medicaid, uh, they're being required to take patients and to admit black physicians and dentists. So let's talk about a little bit more about War Memorial. And can you tell us the, the dynamics in the room at that meeting where Dr. King was called upon to help calm the, the students and get, a, get you all refocused and to agree to the terms? 
to wait a little while longer. Well, let me just say, as students, we had tremendous respect for Dr. King. There was no question about that. However, we didn't always agree. Let's, uh, we were students, and we didn't have the patience that some other people had. Dr. King, you know, as you know, was ahead of his time in so many ways. He was not always ahead of the students in terms of what we wanted to do and what we felt we should do. And so there were times when, when we had to be cautioned that this was a movement and we needed to work together. We didn't always listen to that, but uh, certainly we tended to listen to Dr. King most of the time. And Warren Memorial was a, and to tell you that I remember all the details from that, that experience, I don't remember all the details, but I remember the controversy and I remember the role that Dr. King played. Um, A.T. Walden, I know, was a, a key figure, key leader in the movement. Were there more that you wanted to share with us, uh, focus and drive ahead? No, as I said, I think the names that come to my mind, uh, and we talked about Attorney Hollowell and more, uh, Jesse Hill, I will always remember and appreciate. Q.V. Williams, and I guess he died a few years before Jesse Hill, but they were always there counseling us uh, and supporting us. And they had the ability to really sometimes get us to listen because they had been so supportive in terms of going out bail when we got in jail. So those two names stand out. Dr. Mays, as president of, of Morehouse, I will always appreciate, not only because he was a president who felt it important to speak to students in chapel every Tuesday morning. Uh, having been a college president since then, I still haven't quite figured out he, how he was able to do that. But I know that on Tuesday, you could expect Dr. Mays to be the speaker, and we had to go to chapel six days a week, every day except Saturday. Uh, and that only changed, I think, in my senior year. But but he was there. Dr. Mays was a kind of leader who was very respected in Atlanta. Uh, even the police chief, uh, at that time I think Chief Jenkins, used to call Dr. Mays and say, I have one of your students. I know when I got arrested at the time that we were on hunger strike, uh, Chief Jenkins called Dr. Mays to assure him that he had one of his students in jail, but he was going to make sure that nothing bad happened. Uh, even though we were on a hunger strike at that time. But Dr. Mays was a tremendous uh, human being, tremendous speaker, tremendous leader, highly regarded uh, by students throughout the Atlanta University Center. And, uh, and my relationship with him continued throughout his life. He spoke at, at my inauguration as president of Meharry Medical College. And uh, I just have great appreciation for him and his life and leadership. So I understand the quadrangle was the place where the students gathered and strategized before they went out yeah. to sit in, face sit ins, and rally and got direction there. You want to talk about the quadrangle? Well, quadrangle is very special for many reasons as a gathering place uh, in the AU Center. And at that time, especially for students from throughout the uh, University Center, that was one of the places that we came together and strategized and debated. There, I do specifically remember one occasion in which, um, in which uh, they were trying to get us to wait, and it was probably during the time of the campaign that I mentioned, uh, and we had a great debate. Students had disagreements. Uh, I had a vice president uh, and some others who were involved, and we didn't always agree among ourselves about whether we should go forward with a specific plan uh, uh, move, movement or uh, specific intervention. So I do remember disagreements taking place in the quadrangle, but we generally always uh, ended up at a place that allowed us to move forward. But we didn't always agree, even among ourselves. Mm -hmm. Rush Memorial, very supportive of the students. Do you want to talk a little bit? Yeah, I guess what I remember. Um, I remember that was a place where we used to gather. And one of the things that we did uh, that I appreciated a lot, we actually anticipated some of the things that were going to happen to us when we went out to demonstrate. 
because we were spat upon, we were, we were hit, and we used to practice, you know, how to fall so that you would do less harm, how to protect your head. And uh, Rush uh, was one of the places that we could go and do those kinds of things. The leadership at Rush Memorial was very supportive, and so I have great memories of that church and what it meant. Anything else you want to uh, share with us about that time, uh, student movement? Well, I guess the main thing I, I, I want to say again is that uh, I came to Morehouse uh, determined that I was going to be a physician, that I was going to get into medical school, and uh, so I knew that I had to do well. So I took my books to jail with me, and sometimes the students would laugh at me for doing that, but on the one hand, I wanted to be involved and I was committed to the movement. On the other hand, I wanted to be ready to go to medical school because, you know, my history was such that that was very important. Uh, I had grown up in a situation, again, very segregated, almost died as a child from whooping cough and pneumonia, and there was one black doctor in Anniston who came out to the farm. So he died before I was five years old, Dr. Jackson. So by the time I was six, I was telling everybody I was going to be a doctor like Dr. Jackson. So all during the time that I was involved in the movement, uh, I still was determined that I was going to go to medical school. But I think what happened to me in the student movement is that it changed my perspective. And, and from, you know, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to practice medicine, to I have a responsibility to be a leader in medicine. I have the responsibility to change medicine to make sure that people have access to health care. So that was the attitude that I went to medical school with. And I think it has a lot to do with what I've done in my career, starting when I was a medical student. I think it influenced my behavior as a medical student, and it certainly has influenced my behavior in my career. We um, had the opportunity to interview uh, Vice Mayor Sam Sell at the time. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. And he gave us some insight into the political side of things. Do you recall any pushback from the political leaders during that time? Well, I sure do. Um, uh, even at the level of the governor, um, I remember serious pushback in terms of somebody not just taking a leadership position, but even threatening the students, uh, especially when it came to going to certain restaurants. So. On the one hand, the leadership of Atlanta was, was very progressive. I think that was true of uh, Mayor Ivan Allen and to a certain extent Mayor Hartsfield. And not that they were supportive of everything that we did. They were not quite there, but we moved everybody forward. But at the level of the governor, uh, we had some major pushback and even violent pushbacks at that, at that level and former governors of the state. You got a lot from Lester yeah, he's the one that had the, the axe handle, I believe it was, that he threatened us with if we came to that restaurant. Uh, so he was an extremist in that sense. And, and I think um, not necessarily representative of Atlanta, but certainly, as you know, Atlanta is only a small part of Georgia. So I think uh, as the governor and certainly afterwards, he represented uh, that component of Georgia uh, which made it very difficult uh, to, to make progress, and, and yet Atlanta has managed to overcome a lot of that, and we did during that time. But Lester Maddox was certainly a memorable character uh, because of his threats, uh, because of the, the axe handle and things that he said he would do. What comes to mind when somebody says Atlanta, the city too busy to hate? Well. I have a very positive attitude toward Atlanta just in spite of what I went through because I think Atlanta has been busy trying to move forward. Atlanta has had some of the best leadership in the country. Uh, of course, Maynard Jackson, uh, the first black mayor uh, of Atlanta, just sort of set a very great pace. And I think Atlanta has had great leadership in the city council, at the state, you know, Julian Bond went on to become uh, of course, a member of the state legislature, and it's, and most people remember when he was nominated for president and had to admit that he was too young. Uh, but um, 
So uh, there are a lot of positive things about Atlanta's history when you put it in the context of the South. Uh, but certainly Atlanta had some serious problems that we as students felt that we were obligated to confront, and we did. Council member, are you still with us? Yeah, I guess the, the major thing that I would say is that Dr. King said something that has been very important in my life. One oh, one second. So you ready? Okay. Um, I was thinking about something that, that Dr. King said, and as I said, there were a few of us who would walk from the Morehouse campus to Ebenezer whenever we knew that he was going to be in town. He was co-pastor of Ebenezer. But uh, I may not be quoting this exactly, but he said basically until a person, he said a man, but until a person finds something for which he is willing to die, uh, he's not fit to live. Well, you know, short of death, there's some other things that we have to be willing to give up. And some people argued that by going to jail, I risk my career in medicine. And there were other students uh, who would say that they didn't come to Morehouse to get involved in any movement. They came to Morehouse to qualify for medical school or what have you. But I have never been sorry that I made the decision to become a part of the student movement. Now, it didn't work out the same for everybody. I imagine there were students who ended up dropping out of school or who had trouble. Uh, and of course, if you look at it nationwide, there were even students who were killed. But, um, and certainly beaten severely, like with the freedom riots. But I do think it's important for us to have things that we care about, that we have values, and that we are guided by those values. Um, for example, when I got to medical school, I was faced with situations, even though I was in Cleveland in the north, um, I once had to walk out on, a, on, a, on an experience in OBGYN because I thought black women were being mistreated. Um, and I've written about that story about, and I was the only black student on that rotation. But basically, uh, before Medicare and Medicaid were fully implemented, uh, people who couldn't pay for their care had to be used and trained. They had to agree that they could be used in training of students and residents. And when I started my OBGYN rotation, they took us in this room. There were four black women already in stirrups. And they basically said, we're going to teach you how to do pelvic exams. They didn't even bother to introduce the women. They, so I walked out on that experience. Um, and they threatened to put me out of medical school. But the next morning, all of the other students walked out, even though they were all white. They said that they had thought about it and they agreed with me that it was inhumane. And so when I went to see the dean the next morning thinking that he was going to be the one to put me out of school, he said, uh, do you know what happened this morning? And I said, no. He said, all the other students walked out. And he said, David, obviously we have to change that program, and we will. And they did, dramatically. And so, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is it was a big risk to take, but I think what the student movement taught us, uh, what, what became a part of us as a result of participating in the student movement, is that we really had to have some things that were of value to us, that we cared about enough that we were able to risk some of the other things in our lives, you know, like success. And uh, that's been my attitude, I think, throughout my career, that um, 
There was not enough to be in a position, whether it was President Meharry, a director of the CDC, or Surgeon General. If I didn't make a difference, if there were not things that I cared about enough that I was willing to take risks, that I didn't deserve to be in the position. So I think the student movement was sort of the beginning of that for me, and it's been a part of my life ever since. Anything else, council member? Well, thanks for asking the question. I appreciate the opportunity to respond to that. That's a very important part of who I've tried to be in my life and career is really continuing uh, to keep things in perspective. Uh, at, at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, we like to say that in order to eliminate disparities in health and achieve health equity, we need leaders who first care enough. And then we need leaders who know enough, uh, leaders who have the courage to do enough, and leaders who will persevere until the job is done. That's what we teach our fellows, that's what we teach um, our community health leaders, that it all starts with caring and knowing what it is that you value and care about. So I better quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> We could do this all day. <laughs> well, I, pre I appreciate my first involvement with the student movement. That would have been 1960. So you're, you're talking about 45, well, no, 55 years ago almost. Mm -hmm. It's a long time. And, um, and I don't remember a lot of t details, but I do remember the major issues and events and the spirit with which we did what we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have tremendous regard. Yeah, Marion has been consistent since she was a student at Spelman, and she was two years ahead of me. She doesn't like for me to talk about that since I have so much gray hair. But uh, she was two years ahead of me. She's been a tremendous uh, inspiration throughout my career. And even now, I think uh, last year, the year before, uh, we did a program at the National Cathedral together talking about the whole issue of gun violence and its impact in the black community. Marion actually preached that Sunday at the cathedral, but I was, I was involved uh, on a panel talking about the public health approach to gun, gun violence. Otis Moss has uh, gone on to become one of the great leaders in this country in terms of ministers, and as you know, he chaired the board at Morehouse College for several years. I think he's still on the board. Uh, Lonnie King, of course, has uh, been a leader in Atlanta. Lonnie was a leader in the movement. Charles Black is still around. Uh, Brenda Sue Hill, who is now Brenda Cole, went on to become a judge. But Brenda and I was in the same year. Brenda and my, my future wife, Callie, were, were roommates at Spelman. But I've known Brenda since we were freshmen. And I hope you've interviewed her. We have. Okay. We have. And she gave us some great insight on the city and said great. Oh, great, very good. She would, she would probably, some of that happened after I left and went to medical school. Uh, I'm trying to think. And of course, uh, John Smith, uh, you've interviewed, I take it. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the ones that come to my mind immediately. And I mentioned Julian Bunn, of course. I uh, hope you get a chance to interview him if you haven't. Uh, I talk to him every now and then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that, Michael. <laughs> yeah. No, he's. Uh, uh, he's a tremendous uh, role model, courageous guy in so many ways.
Good. Good. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I wish you could interview and you probably won't be able to because I don't even know where she is. But uh, there was a, an exchange student at Spelman whose name was Annie Jo Weaver. She was white. Um, uh, she uh, came to Spelman as an exchange student and got involved in the movement. As I remember it, her parents were concerned about her being involved in the movement. And when it came time for her exchange to end, uh, she decided that she wanted to stay on. And her parents said if she stayed on, they would not continue to support her. So Annie Jo got a job at Spelman. I know she was selling ice cream for a while. But Annie Jo was the student who was with me when we went on the hunger strike. And it was really her idea. We were on the way to jail. And she asked me if I had ever been on a hunger strike. And I told her no. And, uh, and she suggested that, you know, we, we, maybe we should do that. And uh, because we were trying to draw attention to the problems in Atlanta. And I think that was, that state, that was on the front page. Uh, somebody sent me an article recently from the Atlanta Journal Constitution. I think it was May 23rd, 1963. It's an article about the uh, hunger strike. And these things put a lot of pressure on the business community. Uh, Atlanta was becoming a global city and the business community wanted to see itself as a leader globally. So it, the time came when they could no longer afford these kinds of stories. And I think the students uh, took advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Now, I, don't, I wish I could tell you more about Annie Jo Weaver. I probably will be able to think of the inst Mount Holyoke, I believe she may have been from. I may be wrong about that. But um, I had the last time I communicated with Annie Jo, I think um, it had just been announced that I was going to be appointed director of the CDC, I think it was. And, and I got a letter from her, and I responded. But then I never heard from her again, because uh, I think she went into some kind of religious order or something. Uh, and, and so it hasn't been easy to, to be in touch with her. But her name was Annie Jo Weaver. And I don't know whether Spellman, that's a good that's a thought, is that maybe Spellman knows how to get in touch with her. Okay. Yeah. It would be great to get her. Yeah, it would be great. Mm -hmm. It'd be great to get her perspective. Okay.